Good evening. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Exploring Viewfinders with Susan Van Scoy, PhD, who is joining me with on screen, oh, joining me on screen right here, excuse me. The Heckscher Museum of Art is pleased to present this program as an exclusive benefit for our members and donors like all of you. So thank you for joining us this evening and for your ongoing support of the museum. We sincerely appreciate everything you do to stay involved here. I'm Caitlin Scher, Development Manager at the museum, and I'll be your host this evening. Um, please note, if you'd like to turn on closed captioning, you can hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Joining me on screen is our featured speaker this evening, Dr. Susan Van Scoy. Dr. Susan Van Scoy is an associate professor at St. Joseph's University, Long Island, where she joined the art history department in 2015. She teaches coursework in the history of photography, American art, modern art, and more. Susan's research interests include female photographers of the 1980s, the history of photography, and public art and architecture. She has recently published The Big Duck and Eastern Long Island's Duck Farming Industry and contributed 42 artist texts to Landscape Painting Now. Her current research projects include the photo documentation of the invasion of Fire Island and Kenji Nakahashi's drawings, paintings, and photo conceptual work. We are proud to have Susan as part of the Heckscher Museum family, uh, where she's been involved in many aspects of the organization, including serving as a juror for the 2022 Long Island Biennial, a co-chair of the museum's 2022 benefit, and we're happy to say that she's one of the honorees of this year's Celebrate Achievement Benefit. Susan Van Scoy is the guest curator of Viewfinders Photographers Frame Nature, which is the topic of discussion this evening, uh, which is now on view at the Heckscher Museum through April 16th. At the end of the presentation, Susan will be responding to some of your questions, so please feel free to type those into the Q&A box or chat at any time on your screen. Uh, I will now hand the program over to our featured speaker, Susan. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, let's see, I just wanna share my screen. Let's see. Um, the screen share. And okay, so. Hopefully everyone can see my screen uh, and can hear me okay. Let me know if you can't. Um, so thank you so much, Caitlin, for your technological help. Um, and I'd like to also thank Carly Wurzelbacher, who is a uh, curator at the Heckscher for her help uh, in, for preparing for this exhibition um, with the text and the labels, um, as well as all the staff at the Heckscher. Um, everyone's been so great, so nice. I loved working with, with um, you all. And I'd just like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I know you have many choices, like uh, what Southwest says. <laughs> um, I know you have a lot of places to be. Um, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I also know we have some artists in attendance um, who are featured in the exhibition. So I, I look forward for from uh, any questions from them as well. And um, I'd like to we can get started. Uh, so the Heckscher uh, approached me to guest curate a photography exhibition from their permanent collection. And I got to go through over you know, 400 of their photographs. And um, I was go maybe going to do like a New York, New York show, but that's been done before. <laughs> um, and really the theme of landscape was very strong. It was like a dominant theme in the collection. And I also, when I studied at Stony Brook for my doctorate, I read an article that stayed with me. It was called, um, it was by Deborah Bright and it from 1985. Uh, and it was called Of Mother Nature and Marlboro Men. And she outlines the trends in landscape photography, uh, focusing on American landscape photography, um, and, but also the highs and lows of landscape photography. Um, and I felt like a lot of the works in the collection really kind of um, illustrated the, um, her critiques of landscape photography. So I divided the works into five sections. The first gallery um, contains the picturesque, the sublime, and the denatured. And it provides a nice timeline of 
beautiful landscapes to kind of scary landscapes to landscapes that have been destroyed by humans. And then the back room contains the, when artists kind of go crazy with landscape and use it more as an inspiration, a jumping off point. Um, and, and the back room contains abstract and imaginative. And uh, we're looking here at Kenji Nakahashi's work trimming, which I think perfectly encapsulates a March day, right? Uh, every morning I wake up and I look outside my window and this is what I see in February and March. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and this is kind of uses a disclaimer that not all the works, um, the classifications that I gave you are not mutually exclusive. Uh, several works can fit into several different categories. For instance, this work by Kenji Nakahashi, it does exhibit qualities of the abstract because it's very flat and has this nice web of branches. Um, it displays the sublime because they're there, it's kind of terrifying that this small man, this small figure is up so high without any harness or protective gear. Uh, the imaginative, um, he almost looks, he's transformed into a tightrope walker, uh, part of like a circus act, um, as well as the denatured because, um, you know, as from the title tells us, he's cutting down the branches. Um, so cutting down the trees. Okay, so the first section is called the picturesque. And as Caitlin mentioned, uh, I did contribute to a book called Landscape Painting Now in 2019. And I was struck by how, how so many contemporary painters are using photography uh, to inform their landscape paintings. Um, and so that got me to thinking how much paintings have influenced photography compositions. And so that's what this section is about, the picturesque. Uh, it is also known as a Claudian la uh, landscape, which is named for the 17th century French painter, Claude Lorraine. He was an, um, an academic and he would create these fictional scenes from Roman Akkadian poetry. Um, so like the painting we're looking at now, this is not a real scene. <laughs> Um, it is imaginative, uh, but people think that it's real. Um, and it follows a certain formula that was put out in the academy often, um, where you have the canvas is divided, the composition is divided into thirds, into a, a foreground, a midground, and a background. Uh, you usually have a reflective body of water in the center uh, to add a nice balance to the upper half of the work. And then you also, you usually have trees framing the sides. Um, and so it really allows the viewer to have an entry point into the work and to kind of meander and lose themselves in the work, um, which adds to a sense of relaxation. And so I found, I thought it was interesting that so many photographers imitate this uh, Claudian or picturesque composition in their works, uh, such as this one by NJ, uh, NJ Jaffe. This is Long Island Sound from Comset. This is um, the great um, grandson to the founder of the department store, Marshall Fields. So it's Marshall Fields, the thirds, the thirds estate. And um, uh, this kind of really captures that picturesque quality. Um, I added the, the lines, the, the grid over it, and you can see how the vista is divided into uh, foreground, midground, background, body of water in the center, and trees framing either side. Um, and so um, it's interesting that landscape architects were also influenced by painting compositions. And uh, the, the Fields family, when they were designing this estate, they hired uh, the Olmst Olmstead family landscape firm and they moved, this was not wild nature. They moved um, trees, they brought in mature trees, they um, created fresh water ponds. Um, and and blasted out lots of earth and built a causeway um, and a, a electricity, added electricity and plumbing. And so this is not wild nature, but it's interesting to see how painting compositions affected la um, landscape architecture uh, that affected 
landscape photographers. <laughs> And uh, this is another one of Comsa. It's I'm um, um, sitting steps away from the scene. I live on the neck, so it's interesting. I always love seeing photographs of Comsa. Uh, and then um, who we I couldn't leave out William Grabowski is Heckscher Lake Blue. This is where the museum is located, uh, Heckscher Park in Huntington. And this this also captures that picturesque quality. This is what we woke up to after the snowstorm on uh, Tuesday morning, I think. Um, it's all gone by now, but um, he really did capture that picturesque and also, again, using that formula of um, foreground, midground, background, trees framing the sides and reflective body of water in the center. Uh, this uh, was also featured recently in the, um, the exhibition on um, with all the moon imagery, but I had to use it again for this landscape exhibition. Um, no, most notably, this work by Steichen also follows, um, he was a painter as well, and it follows the painting compositions. Again, mid-ground, foreground, mid-ground, background, reflective body of water in the center. Um, this is capturing, uh, this is in Westchester, Mamaroneck. <laughs> um, and uh, this work is very interesting. It actually broke auction records um, in 2006, because um, a variation of this work printed by Steichen himself in 1904 uh, was the was a of the photo a photograph that that claimed the highest price at auction uh, for I think uh, I have it written down uh, 2.9 million dollars in, in 2006. So the Hector is very lucky to have this version in their collection. Uh, another work that I saw a strong inspiration in landscape painting was uh, Stanley Twardowitz's Spain on the left, Cleric Beneath Tree from 1952. Uh, this was captured at, um, this is a landscape in a Spanish monastery. He captured the monk uh, looking contempl contemplatively out. And I, I, had, I was reminded of Washington Alston's Elijah in the Desert, uh, from 1818, uh, Washington Alston was con considered the first American romantic painter. Uh, this work is at the Boston Museum of Fine Art. It was the first object accepted into the collection. Uh, and he was praised for injecting landscape with the spiritual. Uh, back in back in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, landscape was kind of a lowly genre, especially in the academies. Um, it was um, it was uh, valued underneath history paintings, um, and, I th and even I'm pretty sure even portraiture. So artists in the United States they really saw an opportunity with landscape to create an American identity separate from Europe. Uh, and also um, by injecting it with a sense of spirituality and, um, and religion, uh, biblical verses, it was a way to elevate landscape as a genre so it would, it would um, be more respected. Uh, and again, I was just struck by the similarity in the trees <laughs> as well as the religious content. Uh, and here we also have some more picturesque works by Carol Fond, uh, Salt Marsh, Lloyd Neck, that same formula being followed, and um, Joanne Mulberg's North Fork, Long Island. We have that um, uh, thirds again in the composition. Uh, a subset of the picturesque I wanted to include is the topographical tradition. These were more, um, these works are not in the exhibition, um, but uh, these are two photographers, Timothy O'Sullivan and William Henry Jackson, who led uh, geographical surveys. They were they would be hired by you know, the United States government as well as railroad companies and oil companies to travel out west and survey the lands and to um, photograph the lands uh, to stand as kind of an objective document of the newly acquired territories. Um, however, in doing so, um, we know that photography is not objective and they would leave out, um, you know, they would leave out inhospitable territories, they would leave out uh, the existence of Native Americans on the land. 
Um, William, William Henry Jackson particularly would make the works look like postcards to get people to settle out West. Um, and so these were used as um, governmental records. And um, here we, we have a nice counter, counter um, point to uh, William Henry Jackson's erasure of uh, Native Americans. We have um, the, the contemporary artist, uh, Jeremy Dennis, who is part of the Shinnecock Nation, um, who lives on Long Island. And he created a photo um, document, documentation website called On The Site that documents um, tribes on Long Island and um, and um, and the impact, sorry, how the land has impacted them, their cultures, their traditions. So it is um, a website that contains uh, photography by Jeremy Dennis, as well as text and um, information about all the different tribes. Um, and this is called Wikatok, and it captures um, the we the Wikatok tribe that was um, that inhabited uh, Noyak Pond in Southampton. Um, and you can see the pond very like in a little like sliver over here through the trees. Um, another topographical example is Neil Scholl's photographs of Comset. Uh, he created these also very picturesque looking photographs, but he included uh, a survey map underneath each one um, and uh, from 1997. And these are on view at the gallery. And he said, quote, I did comps it because they were going to turn it into an atomic plant, a golf course, and I didn't want that. So I went up and I photographed it and I put with each photograph a geographical survey map at the bottom showing exactly where it was photographed. So after they screw it up, they can see what it looked like before. <laughs> um, luckily, they haven't screwed it up. And it, it, it does look pretty similar to this uh, because it is protected, um, thankfully. Uh, let's see, one of uh, the works with the maps definitely also reminded me of a famous painting by the Hudson uh, River School uh, founder, Thomas Cole. His view from Mount Holyoke is a very famous American landscape painting, uh, features a blasted tree. Um, and this is supposed, this leads us into our next section, uh, the sublime. And the blasted tree is a recurring motif uh, that originated in European painting, um, but it, it is definitely made famous by this work that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, here he divides the work diagonally and shows the pastoral, the, the developed land on the right, um, and then the sublime on the left. Um, and the blasted tree represents uh, a lightning, how nature can just take down a tree um, and, hu and humans ineffectiveness against nature's power. Um, and I see this nicely echoed in this work, this um, driftwood, this huge, you know, tree that's been tossed about by the water and um, you, we don't know how old it is. It's just this, um, and it was, it's been kind of like petrified. Oops. Okay, so the second section in gallery one is the sublime um, or wild, <laughs> wild nature. Um, and it's in opposition to the picturesque. It, this is a term popularized by philosopher Edmund Burke, um, which features vast rugged natural scenes emphasizing the power of nature. So it's, it's supposed to inspire awe in its views, but also a little bit of terror, but viewed from a safe distance. And Caspar uh, David Friedrich is a famous German romantic uh, painter, and he often creates this um, sublime paintings. Uh, this wanderer above the mists. And I, um, there is a Korean contemporary artist, Kyun Duk Su, who has taken all these sublime views and has added um, uh, iPhones into all of the compositions as a comment on contemporary culture, how people cannot enjoy a sublime, a wild view without taking out their phone and having to, you know, snap you know, create a photograph it. We can't just enjoy it with our own eyes. <laughs> um, and also, uh, 
in keeping with the sublime, many of you hear about this in uh, the news. Every so often you hear about, um, you know, hiker, uh, honeymooners, uh, fall to their deaths after taking a selfie um, because people are so wrapped up in taking photographs of these sublime views. They don't realize they're actually very dangerous. Um, so I, I remind my students all the time to make sure you're safe when you're taking your selfies. Uh, let's see. So um, the Niagara Falls, it was definitely, that's definitely the most that was um, 19th century writers said that Niagara Falls was the, was the most sublime location in North America. Uh, and as, as soon after the invention of photography, photographers such as George Barker uh, went out, uh, went to the falls and set up studios, daguerreotype studios and would sell these views to tourists. Um, and so, um, this definitely shows a sublime view, the mighty falls, the mist, this kind of footbridge. Uh, and every time I see these photographs, they reveal something new to me. In the gallery, I notice there's these really tiny people right here. Um, and that sublime is definitely, when you see tiny people, that's definitely a sublime work because it really shows how people are so small compared to nature's power. <laughs> um, yes, we're very, we're here just a, a blip. We're, <laughs> uh, we, humans come and go, but you know, nature, nature often wins. Uh, let's see. And uh, this work is by uh, Kenji Nakahashi, who is, a Japanese photographer who was living in the United States and he was going on cross country trips to museums um, to show his work. And after a, a, a trip to Canada, he decided to do a Niagara Falls shoot. Um, and so this is his 1990 work, Niagara Falls. It's divided into three sections, which is very reminiscent of the old daguerreotype panoramas of, that were sold at the falls. Um, this is not in the show, but for reference. Uh, but however, his work is showing uh, the, uh, the same view or very similar views, but um, basically the, the negative, three frames on the negative, and then he cut the right and left frames in half. But it does give a sense of movement. Uh, and then Niagara Falls is definitely an American icon, uh, a, a very popular tourist spot. In fact, I've hosted many au pairs and whenever there, it's their turn to travel, uh, I ask them where they're going and they're, they're one of their first stops is Niagara Falls, which is so funny to me because I've lived here forever. I've never been to Niagara Falls. Um, but when, you know, European people, when they come to visit or people um, from outside the United States, they, they, the, one of their first trips is to Niagara Falls. <laughs> um, and I, I brought in this quote by Edmund Burke, who, um, uh, how do we tell the difference between the beautiful and the sublime? Um, and he kind of lists the, the characteristics that allow you to decide, is it beautiful or is it sublime? Um, and I thought of this quote when I looked at Raymond German's waterfall in Ithaca, New York. Um, this quote came to mind, especially when it talks about the line. Um, so Burke wrote, for sublime objects are vast in their dimensions, while beautiful ones are small. Uh, beauty should be smooth and polished. Uh, the great rugged and negligent Beauty should shun the right line, yet deviate from it insensibly. The great, in many cases, loves the right line, and when it deviates, it often makes a strong deviation. Uh, the beauty should not be obscure. The great ought to be dark and gloomy. Beauty should be light and delicate. The great ought to be solid and massive. And that definitely, this quote came to mind when I saw this profile view of a waterfall, the, the line, the deviation of line, um, and that kind of right angle. I just, uh, that came to mind when I, when I, when I viewed this photograph. Uh, and normally sublime works, unlike the picturesque, there's no entry for humans. There's no foreground where a human could be present. It's almost sometimes as if you're hovering above. Uh, Ansel Adams was famous for those as well. Um, and I, I thought of that when I saw this uh, Gulf of Mexico photograph, that there's really no entry point for human, human presence. 
Uh, the last section in the gallery one is denatured. Uh, what happens when the natural qualities of a landscape are removed or, or negatively altered for human consumption? Um, and here we have um, Berenice Abbott's Norris Dam in Tennessee, where Niagara, I like to think of Niagara Falls has been replaced by a dam. <laughs> Although they're not the same geographic location, um, the denatured shows how humans are trying to control the water power to prevent flooding of the areas. Um, and, and this you know, is a nice uh, counter, counterpoint to the falls. Uh, humans try to control the water uh, with their constructions. And this is so huge and monolithic, it's like a mountain. <laughs> Uh, also, her cityscape, uh, her documentation of changing New York, West Street, uh, showing the building of the skyscrapers. There's almost nothing organic in this work or living in this work. It's all geometric, you know, buildings, all human made. Um, and this is actually the site of, uh, in the, the background, that's the site of the um, World Trade, where the World Trade Center was and where now the, the memorial is. Um, so this is in the financial district. Uh, Lauren, we can't have a Long Island ex landscape exhibition without the Long Island Railroad. <laughs> um, so Lauren Pimperno, she uh, would commute on the Long Island Railroad and uh, she would photograph the landscape outside the windows. And in fact, you can even see the reflection of the interior of the train in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and this definitely shows denatured. We have this one lone tree that looks very sad and uh, graffiti and concrete. Um, even again, I noticed this later, even the street lamp has been, you know, is broken. Um, so this is, you know, your typical view outside your window on the train. Uh, Larry Fink, whose work was included in the um, home exhibition across the way. Um, his work, Social Graces, he captures kind of um, uh, upper class as well as working class. And um, this is this is capturing uh, the working class in Pennsylvania. Uh, hunting is very popular. And, you know, um, I just found it jarring to see a, a mammal, uh, a deer hanging in a tree. This is a common practice of hunters, but um, it is definitely, it makes you do a double take to see such a large animal um, dead hanging from a tree. Um, seems very unnatural. <laughs> Uh, Kenji Nakahashi, Solitary Panda. Uh, it, here in denatured animals have been reduced to, ex they're extinct and they've become souvenirs. Uh, stuffed animals, you know, there's nothing living. Um, and then we have this nice faux bamboo wall in the background. And uh, Jan Stoller's water purification plant in Hempstead, Long Island. Um, this is a nice, uh, colorful work. It looks like fans are fountains. Um, however, uh, you know, Deborah Bright in her essay, she does caution about um, when artists make uh, sites that are polluted or relating to polluted look um, aesthetically pleasing. Is that uh, misleading or, um, you know, is that, not doing justice to the environment when we make uh, sites related to pollution look pretty. Um, so uh, this is, you know, this they are cleaning the water, <laughs> um, but it it's it's point. Also, we have to think about the fact that the water is getting dirty in the first place, and it has to be purified. Okay, so now moving on to the back gallery. This is where um, artists took creative license with the landscape. Uh, in the first section, we have abstract, where the formal qualities like light, line, color, shape, space, perspective, they're emphasized over the content or the subject matter, uh, generally leaving out signs of narrative, humanity, or those classical landscape elements in a move that was thought to democratize the landscape to make it available to, to everyone who, who might not understand Roman Akkadian poetry. All right, so the first work um, on the left, we have uh, Kenji Nakahashi's Cut Out Sky series. Um, he used what's known as a um, worm's eye view where he, uh, he would do like acrobatics uh, and literally lay on the street of lower Manhattan. 
uh, and he would capture these worm's eye views looking up uh, and which are fixed in these kind of flat abstract cross-shaped patterns for the most part. Um, I love pointing out this little bridge that connects the two buildings. Um, and he also documented his work meticulously. Um, this is a, a nice uh, diagram he created, I think over, um, an, the series took a number of years. It started in 1979. Uh, he took over, I, I think about 40 uh, shots for this series and he outlined all the locations on this map of lower Manhattan. Um, they don't seem to go in any order, um, but it is, it's so helpful to have. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, William Eggleston, who is considered the king of uh, color photography. Uh, color photography was, con was considered in the commercial realm, and he's one of the first photographers who use color uh, and in a fine arts context and got it accepted for fine art photography, not just advertising and commercial, commercial uh, illustrations. Um, so this is his Jamaica Botanical Series, uh, and funny story about this, um, this is so abstract, we couldn't tell, and we still can't tell which way is, is right, um, which way um, the one, this one in the middle is with the orientation of this one. Um, and I almost think that Eggleston didn't want us to know. He wanted us to keep, he wanted it to be, you know, openly interpreted, um, but we did, uh, we, the um, Carly wrote the staff at the foundation um, and we just didn't want to print it the wrong way if he did have a preference over the orientation. Um, but I'm not sure if we ever heard back, but I just think it's, it's so abstract. We don't know which way is the orientation. It could be probably seen from all directions. Okay, um, Stuart McCallum. He's shooting in the tradition of group F64, uh, the smallest uh, aperture setting on a camera that allows for a wide depth of field. So everything is very crisp and everything is pre-visualized before he um, presses the button and uh, very much in the style of Edward Weston. And uh, one critic famously said that photographs like this can make you know, um, a flower or a pepper look more sensual than a nude. Um, and I think that's definitely true in this case as well. Now, uh, moving on to our last section is imaginative. Um, these are artists who use uh, reverse tones, collage, inscriptions, reflective surfaces, like uh, mirrored surfaces to create surreal, whimsical, and otherworldly scenes. Uh, the first artist we have is Espir Slobodkina, who was also the illustrator for the famous children's book Caps for Sale, um, but she was also an accomplished sculptor, textile artist, uh, painter, uh, as well as like mixed media, as we see here. Um, this is made out of lace, uh, cutouts, magazines, uh, lace trimming, beading, uh, dried flowers. Uh, it's called In the Snug Harbor of Realized Dreams. And it's kind of, the title is kind of a play on words. Uh, Snug Harbor, in my research, it was actually a home set up by a famous shipping heir in Staten Island for retired sailors. Um, I guess sailors didn't have a pension plan. So um, <laughs> once they were not fit to, to sail, they, um, they went to Snug Harbor. Um, but also we have this uh, mother-child pairing that seems very snug. Um, so definitely uh, the Snug Harbor of Realized Dreams. Uh, let's see. Uh, on the large wall near the exit, we have Martina Lopez's uh, digital collage, Airs Come to Pass. Uh, she would find, she would take her um, photographs of her ancestors and scan them into uh, landscapes that were marred and cracked and um, digitally altered. Um, she would also go to secondhand stores and purchase photographs of people she didn't know and scan them in. Uh, and her title is also a kind of a play on words. Uh, she said that we, how um, people inherit things from their family members, 
um, the good and the bad and the plan or the homonym with errors and errors. We, we also inherit our, the errors of the past. Um, so the, she inserted these figures into this kind of barren, cracked landscape. Uh, Joe Constantino is um, known for shooting using infrared film, which reverses tones. So what is dark becomes light. So you can see, and it creates this kind of uh, surreal, otherworldly scenes. Um, so the, one, the work on the right, old house under tree, all the green has been reversed to white. So um, definitely it looks very uh, whimsical and surreal. This house in, I believe um, this is in Mattatuck, Long Island. Uh, let's see, N.J. Jaffe's Spirit of the Woods and Ponds. This was actually taken in Lloyd Harbor in 1997. Uh, the original is on the left. And um, you, when you look at it, you see, you make out like this wolf face um, with the two eyes and the nose here. Um, however, when you rotate it onto its side, um, you see that this is basically just a bunch of um, bushes uh, that, that's being reflected into the water. Um, so here is the reflection, here is the vegetation. However, when you view it, um, you know, vertically, it creates like kind of this, this wolf like face, which is interesting. Um, the, the what lurks underneath these these landscapes. Um, Barbara Rue has a whole wall to the right in the rear room. Um, she is known for creating uh, mise en scène in the um, forests. Uh, she will insert flames into old you know, like those little raccoon holes. Um, she often puts mirrors or um, picture frames into the work. Uh, she'll find um, cut down trees and inscribe text from poetry or natural history books into them, such as this one, uh, Night Rises Up. Um, and in a way, this, this, this act of this, these frames, mirrors, um, this inserts uh, a sense of human scale into the work, um, human reflection into the work uh, that we that's so often missing in landscape photography. A lot of it is kind of what can the landscape do for humans? And here it's more of a, a balanced relationship. How do humans affect the landscape? How do landscapes affect humans? It's much more uh, symbiotic. <laughs> Uh, this work um, is part of the Jelly Time Capsule, a group of uh, artists working digitally in video and print, um, and they are um, uh, contemporary artists who are focused, a lot of their works focus on climate change, um, climate reform, and legislation, um, and one of the artists featured is Lauren Ruiz, uh, and her work is, in, um, is called Worms on the Green. And she may, her works may seem familiar if you saw the recent 2022 Long Island Biennial at the Heckscher. Uh, her work was the one where um, you listen to earthworms um, through headphones. And that was a, definitely a crowd favorite. I know my children love this one. Um, but she, we brought her in again for viewfinders. And um, her work, Worms on the Green, she studies, uh, she calls it um, eco, uh, eco imperialism, I think, are the word. Uh, but anyway, she 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 studied the earthworm and how it was not native to the to North America. It came over with European uh, colonialists. Uh, so she studies eco colonialism, um, and she she studies how the life cycle of the earthworm and how earthworms actually work to rid the soil of toxins and plastics. They adapted to this new environment. Um, and they rid, they, they clean the soil. Um, so how, and so I think it's interesting here how she captures the earthworms in front of a green screen. So in today's digital world, um, we don't have, it's, a, we, there's no landscape, but we have the famous green screen behind us. 
Uh, and the last work I wanted to talk about was, is part of the Jelly Group as well. Um, I bring in um, Mikhail Levin's Bell Haven from 2020. Um, and this is a nice, this is a video work that weaves together uh, interstices of darkness and landscape. This was done during um, the COVID pandemic uh, in uh, Brookhaven, by, on the shore of Brookhaven. Uh, and there's a blasted tree. There's that blasted tree again that we see. Uh, let's see. And um, I love to hear this, the, the you know, nature. Uh, but then you hear human, the human impact on nature uh, throughout this. Uh, you see the houses, the homes, uh, the, the light poles. So this is not nature untouched. You see human, the human impact on nature. Uh, cupolas from homes, I believe. Um, not just human presence, but also you hear human sounds. Around the three minute mark, you hear the siren, the fire, the firehouse siren. And it, it's amazing when it's captured on video, you hear it for 25 seconds. And the, you know, it's kind of, um, it's noise pollution in a way. You're, it's it's um, interrupting the sound of nature. So that really uh, stood out to me when I, when I watched this. All right, so that is all that I have. Uh, those are all my slides. Um, and then, and I, again, I'd like to thank you for, for taking your time out to listen uh, uh, to, some, to some behind the scenes insights on viewfinders. And if you haven't seen the show, I hope you do uh, come see it. It's up till April 16th. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. That was fabulous. Um, very interesting hearing your insights into curating the exhibition and all of the artworks. Um, we'll take a couple minutes now to answer some questions. So I think there's some starting to come into the Q&A box, but if you have any questions, please type them in. Um, so our first question is, Long Island has such a rich tradition in painting. Is that also true for, of photography? Oh, definitely. Um, I, I did want to pull that in, like artists, you know, come to Long Island specifically, we know like, you know, Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, uh, and now April Gornick, so many artists, uh, especially particularly in the East End. Um, but in this um, show, we feature, there's a, a lot of Long Island artists featured, uh, local artists, as well as artists out East, um, Jeremy Dennis, uh, NJ Jaffe, um, all, I think most of the jelly artists seen here uh, live on Long Island, Stanley Twardowitz. Um, I don't know, I would say probably at least 50% of the artists featured uh, in this exhibition have lived on Long Island or still live on Long Island. But Carly can correct me <laughs> if she's here. <laughs> That's or at least Manhattan, definitely Manhattan, but uh, Long Island, yeah, I would say, a, I would say a strong 40 to 50%. Um, yes. Great. Um, another question. Um, so I think you commented on this a little bit earlier when you mentioned um, the relationship between color photography and fine art, but um, just noticing that a lot of the photographs, even contemporary photographs, are black and white. Um, could you comment on that a little bit? Uh, let's see. It's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we had the artists from Jelly featured because um, uh, I, I want to speak about digital a little bit. Um, you know, museums are still a little uh, slow to uh, invest completely in digital um, and, and, and digital. And in, the, in, the, in many ways, the same thing was true of color. Uh, color photography was not wasn't really widely accepted until like the 70s um, and 80s. Um, however, I think with digital, Artists who work digitally, I think, tend to favor color because I think digital color is just, you can do so much with it versus the black and white. Um, so I think if it is not as well represented, it might be because it's also digital and some, 
you know, some museums are, are slow to get on the digital track. <laughs> um, but um, let's see. Sorry, can you ask? I hope I don't. I don't know if I answered. Oh the no, I think I think you answered the question um, in part. I mean, um, you mentioned before that um, black and white was preferable because color was seen as more commercial. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so I guess that's that's sort of the other half of the question. I guess the other other half of the answer, rather. Yes, and Eggleston was he's can he was I think one of the first artists to have a. Uh, at Museum of Modern Art to have a solo exhibition of photography devoted to color photography. Um, however, unfortunately, a lot of these early, um, these artists who experimented with color, um, the, the, the dye transfer process, the color is fading. Wow. <laughs> um, so that's another issue with photography when you use like, you know, different materials. Um, some of it, they don't know what will stand the test of time. Um, so that's another issue that color uh, presents is that the, the, the dye transfer process, certain colors do fade over time. Oh, that's very interesting. Yes. But it's a challenge in, in putting together conservation. Conservation, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, another question and comment. Um, thank you. Very interesting and informative talk. What drew you to the study of photography? Oh, uh, that's an easy because it's um it's pretty new. It's it was invent the, the patent for it was 1839. Uh, when I was in grad school, I felt like everything I chose had been uh, written about so much. <laughs> and when you choose one of those um, topics that, you know, you have to quote every single person that's ever written on it. And I feel like photography is, is a little newer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, it's only, uh, it's 1839, 19, it's less than 200 years old, whereas painting is, uh, you know, is, you know, probably, you know, tens of thousands of years old. So less, uh, less to have to go back on, get to, to less to quote, I guess I could say. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> and um, I don't practice, I get this question a lot. I don't practice photography myself. I mean, my, I'm an amateur cell phone photographer, uh, but I, do not, I am not a photographer. I am, mere, I am just a historian. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're all a little bit photographers these days, like you mentioned with selfies and snapping photos at, at scenic vistas. So um, actually that sort of relates to the next question we have. Um, so you were talking about the sublime and um, the movement West and the government um, using those photographs. Um, do you, would you say that the sublime is very tied into movement into the Western of the United States? And is that like a more of an American thing because of that? Uh, I think um, by the time the Americans were, um, were navigating the West, Europe had already been almost, you know, very uh, industrialized. Uh, so that's another aspect of American landscape photography, uh, American landscape. It, it really, when Americans were in competition with Europe, uh, they really had an advantage to all these kind of untainted, unspoiled, wild land uh, that the Europeans didn't have access to anymore. <laughs> Um, so that was a way for Americans to really uh, create an American identity separate from Europe. They did draw upon European traditions, but it was a way for them to finally, um, particularly with like coal and the Hudson River School, um, it was a way for them to elevate landscape. Uh, like, like I said, in Europe, landscape was considered kind of um, a, a more commercial genre. It wasn't as respected. Great. Um, any other questions from the audience? I think you were very thorough, Susan. It <laughs> seemed like that we have very many questions. Um, 
but I think we'll wrap up then as long as there's no other questions. Um, thank you so much, Susan. This was really spectacular. And I know we all definitely enjoyed hearing your point of view about curating viewfinders. Um, it's great to hear your expertise. Um, and as a reminder, everyone listening can experience these wonderful artworks in person at the museum. Um, viewfinders Photographers Frame Nature is on view until April 16th. Um, you can visit hexra.org um, for more information, including museum hours and programming related to this exhibition. Um, I will throw in a comment to say that um, we have Art in Bloom coming up, um, where garden clubs create flower arrangements based on artworks. Um, they're inspired by the artworks on display. And some of our garden club members will be inspired by viewfinders. So that's um, April 14th, 15th, and 16th. So another tie into nature, definitely please check that out. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Susan. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.